This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's good to be back with you, friends. Welcome to everyone, new or old, or maybe old is the term to use, but <laughs> let's uh, hit the restart button on that. Um, welcome, and let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. Let us join together on this second Sunday of Advent by rising, if you are able, and joining together in our call to worship. A voice cries, prepare the way of the Lord. Let every valley lift every voice. Prepare the way of the Lord, and all flesh shall see the salvation of our God.
sings in the silence, come Emmanuel. Every valley shall be filled, every heart shall be made whole. For peace is stronger than turmoil, and love is louder than hate. As we light our second Advent candle, we pray for the holy peace of God. Come now, O child of Mary. Come now. Let us now confess who we are and who our God is using the confession that is printed in the bulletin. Cleansing God, we hear the call to repentance, but we struggle to respond. A voice tells us to turn around, but we prefer our own ways. You seek to purify us in love, but we constantly elude your searching hand. Our sin leads us in other directions, away from you, away from life. Look with mercy upon us. Clear a place within us so that something new might be born, something that might return us to the way you have shown us in Jesus Christ. Now that we have confessed our sins, our transgressions, we trust in the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and are assured of pardon. Now hear the good news. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Friends, Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. now invite you as you are comfortable both now here present and in the weeks to come make a phone call to someone reach out to someone and wish them peace in the name of the Lord peace of the Lord be with you now
Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes peace needs a little reminder. Let us pray. Loving God, in this season in which we await your word become flesh, its birth, we pray that it might be born in us and through us. Make us receptive to what you would have to say to us this day and help us to bear its fruit in our living. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our first reading is from the Old Testament, from the prophet Malachi, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. The word of the Lord. Now, we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to tell you the words to say, okay, and then we're going to all say them together, okay? All right. Now, the words we are going to say are these, prepare ye, that means you, it's a fancy way to say you, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And in our scripture, John who was Jesus' cousin, that's what I like, how I like to call him, he was Jesus' cousin and they were about the same age. John, people thought John was the Messiah. John said, no, it's not me, he's, he's coming, he's just, you just don't know him yet. Jesus had already been born, you, he, uh, John was just telling us that Jesus was gonna start preaching and they would know him. So one thing we remember during Advent is that Jesus is coming, okay? So one of the things John said was, prepare ye the way of the Lord, because he wanted people to know that it wasn't him that was the Messiah, but the Messiah was coming. So let's practice that, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Okay, here we go. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Okay, now a little bit louder. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Now. It's not often that we get to shout in church because sometimes, like when I was little and maybe now your parents might go, shh, shh, shh. Okay, this is not that time. You get to go, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Okay, let's do it shouting like that. Ready? So everybody can hear. Here we go. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Okay, now, John went around and saw a lot of people. He talked to a lot of people. So let's walk this way. Okay, now when I hold up my hand like this, we are going to shout so everyone can hear us. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Okay, here we go. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Now come this way. Oh, we're going to tell the people again. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Okay, now let's walk over here. The, Lord, the Lord's not here yet. He's not here. He hasn't been born yet. And we, Caden, remember last week we saw the, 
wise people over there? Yeah. They're not here yet. They're not here over here. They're not there yet, but they're making their way. People are making their way to Jesus. John is telling us that Jesus is going to come. So let's, let's stretch out right along here. Yeah, and face, face this way. Okay, face there. Okay, now, one more time, let's celebrate and let's share with everybody the good news. Prepare you the way of the Lord, okay? Here we go. Prepare you the way of the Lord. Very nice. Thank you. And thanks be to God for God's being with us as we wait for Christ to be born. Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the gospel according to Luke, the first chapter of the 67th through the 80th verses, uh, a bit of the backstory, uh, it tells this, this, this uh, scripture is known as the Song of Zechariah, and um, Zechariah, you may or may not remember, is the husband of Elizabeth, um, who, and they were the parents of John the Baptist, and Earlier in Luke's gospel um, is when uh, Elizabeth and Zechariah learned that they were going to give birth to John, and Zechariah is doubtful, and he is unable to speak during the length of Elizabeth's pregnancy. And of course, their child, John, and Mary and Joseph's child, Jesus, will be cousins. So that is a bit of the backstory to this text from Luke's Gospel this morning. Listen for the word of the Lord. Then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. The child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day he appeared publicly to Israel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In some ways, in some ways, when it comes to Christmas, my wife Melissa and I could not be more different. Before we married, for my during my first several years as a bachelor here, I didn't have a Christmas tree. I put up no lights, had no Christmas plates or wreaths. If you walked into my house during Advent, during one of those years, you would have seen little that would have clued you in to the season. I think the only evidence you would have seen were a few scattered nativity sets. That's it. Melissa, on the other hand, has bins full of Christmas decorations. Big, large... Big, large plastic bins that take up considerable space in our garage. 
she has, or perhaps I should say now we have, <laughs> Christmas plates and a vertical wreath for the door and a, another horizontal wreath for the kitchen bar and Christmassy shaped cookie cutters and decorative pine cones and sign decoration things that stick up in our yard and a little model church that lights up and the list goes on. <laughs> Needless to say, we got a Christmas tree our first year of marriage or maybe it was when we were still engaged. And all of this Christmas stuff that she has, now we have, represents a diminishment, a shrinkage of the Christmas stuff that she had before we were married. <laughs> she got rid of stuff when moving into my house, now our house. I think she still bears scars from the pain of that letting go. Where do you fall on the spectrum of Christmas de decorations? Are you more of a minimalist like I used to be or more of a whole hog, pull out all of the stops, go bananas decorator like Melissa? I'm, I'm guessing by the response that I'm getting that uh, Melissa's side wins this one. Now, at their worst, all these decorations can foster a kind of Christmas consumerism. They can prop up the Christmas industrial complex and further the already prevalent association in our culture of Christmas with stuff. The so-called commercialization of Christmas has been around for so long now that it is a cliche, but that doesn't mean that it is any less true. At their worst, all these decorations can distract us from the essence of this season. At their best, however, these decorations can do something different, something better. They can set the stage. They can invite us into a different kind of time. They can signal that we are entering into a different season, indeed a different kind of season. At their best, these decorations, the trees, the wreaths, the nativity scenes, and more, can help us prepare the way, not just for the stuff of Christmas, but for the spirit of it. At their best, they can help us look with anticipation toward what is coming, or rather, who. When I came into the sanctuary this last week after having been gone on vacation and saw these Christmas banners and Advent colors and more, something deep within me said, yes. It's like they speak their own language, one that we need to hear, a language different in many ways from that of our culture they speak with echoes of the past, of a future that is coming. I look at the Chrismon tree and remember Nancy Christie and the many Trinity women who worked with her to craft the Chrismons. At the same time, I look at the Advent wreath and know that we are looking forward to Christmas, to the lighting of the Christ candle that we are waiting for that special day. We're at the empty manger awaiting a Christ child to be laid into it. At their best, decorations draw us more fully, more deeply into the liturgical seasons, especially this season of Advent, especially this season of waiting and preparation. As I mentioned in my greetings article this week, to begin a new year, as Advent does in the liturgical calendar, with the season of waiting is rather odd. The larger culture functions as if New Year's were meant to be rung in with parties and balloons with a festive air that isn't necessarily bad or wrong, but we Christians... We're different. We're odd. We begin the new year by waiting. Imagine inviting someone to a party, and when they ask what is going to happen at the party, you reply, well, we're going to wait together. 
not sure you'd get many people taking you up on your invitation. We tend to see waiting as dead time, wasted time, a kind of temporal desert, a Sahara of time. Nothing to see, nothing to do, boring even. And if there is one thing we dread in our society, a secular cardinal sin, so to speak, it is to be boring, to, be, to fail to entertain. These days, if you stream TV shows or movies, as perhaps most people do, you can fast forward through the slow parts. You can just skip ahead in 10 or 15 second chunks with the press of a finger. Or if you are stuck in that awful phone queue with customer service, waiting on the next customer service representative, you can often give them your number so that they can call you back so that you don't have to wait. I do it, and I'm not saying it's bad. Indeed, I'm grateful for it. But do you see, do you get a glimpse, a taste, a feel for how odd that makes what we are doing here, this collective entering into a season of waiting. Of course, the church is not immune to this tendency to fast forward. Every year as a pastor, or more precisely as a hymn selector, I face a bit of a tension and a challenge. I know, especially as we head later into the month, that people look forward to singing old, familiar Christmas carols, and I know the liturgical season of Christmas is all too short. Pastorally, I'm sympathetic. On the other hand, theologically, I want to guard this Advent waiting time to proclaim it sacred, to say, we aren't there yet. We must wait. And there is value in the waiting. There is value in the waiting. If waiting is the temporal equivalent of the Saharan desert of time, then the gospel proclaims that there is life even in the desert. There is light even in the darkness. It is in the wilderness, after all, not in the lush valleys that John the Baptist proclaims, echoing Isaiah before him, to prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare the way of the Lord out here in the desert, now in Advent, in this season of waiting. Learn how to pay attention to the small, the subtle, the nuanced, for that is how God most often comes to us, not on primetime television during the NFL halftime show, but to a poor couple giving birth in a small country town and laying their child in a manger. Indeed, God wants wise women and men. God wants a people who see new stars and know what they mean. And it is almost impossible to do that without paying attention. Maybe that is why so many people missed Christ's birth at the time. Maybe that is why so many miss it today. Because we haven't learned patience. That first hallmark of love, according to Paul, we haven't learned to wait. Indeed, we would generally prefer to throw waiting into the trash to be sent to the landfill. It's not even worth recycling. In writing this sermon and turning it over again and again in my mind and heart, I wondered, what is this Advent waiting like? What is it analogous to? If I could go anywhere to get the spirit of this season, where should I go? You know what I came up with? An obstetrician's office. No joke, I thought quite seriously about calling up Melissa's obstetrician, whom I've met, or rather his office, and asking if I could go and just sit in the waiting room for 30 minutes. (laughs) Serious. 
I didn't make the call because, ironically, I didn't have the time. <laughs> if Advent is about waiting for the coming of new life, about openness to change and vulnerability and hope, then what better place to be to get into the spirit of the season than the waiting room of an obstetrician's office? It's been years since I've been in an obstetrician's office, but I remember being there several times with Melissa, and I imagine being there again. I look around at the women who are there, and I focus on the ones who are obviously pregnant. They are of different ages, different backgrounds, even from different distances, as some of them have made the trek from Nazareth, I mean Oklahoma. Some of them have a mother with them. More of them have a young man with them, presumably the husband. But some of them are alone, pregnant and alone in the obstetrician's office. Over there in the corner, there is a couple almost mismatched in age. The man is at least a decade older than the young teenage girl. So young. So incredibly, impossibly young. She looks about 15, the age of the young killer from Michigan. But she is not here to take life, but to give it. Her name's Mary. I heard her partner address her that way. She must be frightened. She has to be. As if giving birth in itself isn't scary enough and doing so far from home to give birth when she is so young. And from her dress, it would seem not well to do. A poor teenage pregnant girl waiting in the obstetrician's office. Do you smell it? The scent of Advent? Though I don't know her, part of me wants to say to her, to Anna, I mean Mary, what in the hell are you doing? Are you crazy? Do you know what you're getting yourself into? Of course you don't. How could you? I hate to say it, I'm almost ashamed to even think it, but you could get an abortion, Mary, if not here in Texas, then at least in another state. You have your whole life ahead of you, after all. To have a child now in such unstable personal circumstances, let alone when the world is burning, is, well, what's the adjective? This can't be what you envisioned for yourself. Your life will become harder, so much harder. Yes, you must be frightened, but probably not half as frightened as you should be. She must be frightened, but the odd thing, the disturbing thing, if I'm being honest, is how composed she seems. Her partner is fidgeting far more than she is. Her composure disturbs my own. How can she be so scared and yet so composed? Does she know something that I don't? A truth that transcends reason, a trust that enables hope? Is this what true power looks like? The willingness to give birth to love in a world that will wound and crucify it? I don't know, but I wonder. Sitting near them is another couple, quite older in age, so much older, in fact, that I, if I didn't see the bulge in the woman's belly, a 
bulge that is admittedly hard to miss. I would sooner reckon her for a grandmother than a mother. I heard her give her name as Elizabeth when she checked in. That was my grandmother's name and is Anna's middle name, so I immediately feel the slightest bit of kinship with her and sympathy toward her. She looks to be the oldest pregnant woman in here, probably at least by a decade, even older than I am, believe it or not. I wonder if, like Melissa and I, she needed help getting pregnant, either through in vitro fertilization or something else. Regardless, it must be a minor miracle for someone of her age to become pregnant. Then again, can miracles be minor? If half as much waiting and longing and heartbreak and frustration and despair and hope went into the backstory of this conception, I imagine there is nothing minor seeming to her about the miracle of this pregnancy at all. Sitting next to her is her husband, Zeke. I didn't hear him give his name, but I heard his wife using it. As a matter of fact, I haven't heard him say anything at all. He just sits there in silence, holding Elizabeth's hand. Sometimes, strangely, he writes something down for her to read. Does he have a speech problem, I wonder? I later learned that Zeke indeed does have a speech problem. At his friend's insistence, he visited a few speech pathologists, but strangely enough, they couldn't help him. The problem with Zeke's speech can't be fixed. Indeed, it is perhaps not really a problem at all. His silence, you see, is its own form of advent, its own form of a temporal Saharan desert. It exists in that same in-between space. It is not empty, a waste, devoid of life. It is rather Surprisingly, a gift. I think Zeke didn't appreciate or accept that gift at first, but he eventually came to realize it, which is probably why he stopped going to visit speech pathologists, because he stopped seeing his silence as a problem to be fixed. What is going on with Zechariah, you see, is not so much that he can't speak. That is a symptom, not the main issue. No, the main issue is that Zeke is pregnant. Zeke is a pregnant man. Now, I know, I know the idea of a pregnant man is crazy, an anomaly, if not an impossibility, which is presumably why the physician Luke shared Zeke's story in his journal. And when I say that old Zeke was pregnant, I don't mean it in quite the same sense that all expectant fathers are metaphorically pregnant. Zeke is pregnant not with a child, but with speech with joy, with praise. His pregnancy has coincided precisely with that of his wife, Elizabeth. And it started in much the same way as hers, as all pregnancies start, unbelievably small and stunningly fragile, unnoticeable at first. But over time, it grew. Month after month, his pregnancy of speech and of joy grew subtly and improbably. It caused its own form of discomfort. Even the gestation and birth of joy have their own morning sickness and labor pains. In our passage today, again, according to Luke, Zeke's 
finally gives birth. He bursts forth, not so much in speech as in song. The incandescent joy that shines through his song, which has entered into Christian tradition as the Benedictus, the song of Zechariah, reminds me of many of the trees I've seen around Denton lately on fire with color and beauty. I wonder if Zeke and those trees are even possibly singing the same song if we only have ears to hear it or eyes to see it. Have you ever known a joy like that? A joy that took its time to grow, a joy that sometimes kicked from deep within, a joy that seemed simultaneously so profoundly personal and intimate, yet also so transcendent and other. Such joys don't come lightly or easily, do they? They burn with a holy and purifying fire. They endure. They are reminiscent of the burning bush that Moses saw. They blaze without being consumed. It's an awesome thing to witness that, an awesome and holy thing. Just as I begin to sense that sitting here during Advent in the obstetrician's office, even if only metaphorically, looking at Mary and Elizabeth and old Zeke and their glorious pregnancies, not just of life, but of hope and joy and love, is its own form of gift. I even begin to sense, to suspect, to feel that waiting here with you and with Mary and Elizabeth and Zeke is exactly, precisely where we are supposed to be. Do you get that sense too? And as if this isn't enough, sitting here with you and Mary and Elizabeth and Zeke and others during Advent, feeling strangely more patient and hopeful and grateful than when we first entered, as if this isn't already more than enough, I begin to feel something stirring within me, something new. Was that? No, surely not. But was that a kick I felt? Did anyone else feel it? Surely I, surely we, aren't pregnant too, right? That's not possible. Pregnancy isn't contagious, is it? Surely old souls like mine, like some of yours, I don't want to presume, surely old souls can't give birth to new joys, can they? Or could it be that all of us are somehow pregnant, pregnant with joy and with hope and with love, whether we know it or not, resist it or not, nurture it or not? Could it be that each of us is pregnant with the spirit of Christ, each of us, young and old, black and white, male and female and non-binary, each of us individually and all of us together, as if this place, or better yet, this community, this church, is somehow a fertility clinic of hope and joy and faith and love. Could it be? I wonder, don't you? In the name of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Let us pause for a moment of silent reflection.
Friends, this is God's table. It is God that invites us here. It is God whom we encounter around this table. And paradoxically, it is God who is with us on our journey to this table. This is not Trinity's table. This, you do not have to be a Presbyterian or a member of this church to partake of this feast. This is the feast of God's love and God's grace for all of us. This is the feast at which we are sustained for the journey even as we get a glimpse of its end. Come as you are. Come with your hunger. Come with your need for God's love that you may receive it. Please join me in our liturgy for the Eucharist. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O God, our Creator and Redeemer. In your wisdom you made all things and redeemed them and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image to love and serve you, but we forgot your promises and abandoned your commandments. In your mercy you did not reject us but still claimed us as your own. When we were slaves in Egypt, you freed us and led us through the waters of the sea. You fed us with heavenly food in the wilderness and satisfied our thirst from desert springs. On the holy mountain, you gave us your law to guide us in your way. Through the waters of Jordan, you led us into the land of your promise and you sustained us in times of trial. You spoke through prophets, calling us to turn from our willful ways to new obedience and righteousness. You sent your only Son to be the way to eternal life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels and with all the faithful of every time and place, who forever sing to the glory of your name. Majesty and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. In Jesus, born of Mary, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. He lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, opened blind eyes, broke bread with outcasts and sinners, and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and needy. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. Seated at your right hand, he leads us to eternal life. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this cup and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you, to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Great is the mystery of faith. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, and upon these your gifts of bread and cup, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name, that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. 
Help us, O God, to love as Christ loved. Knowing our own weakness, may we stand with all who stumble. Sharing in his suffering, may we remember all who suffer. Held in his love, may we embrace all whom the world denies. Rejoicing in his forgiveness, may we forgive all who sin against us. Give us strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection, with, when with the redeemed of all the ages, we will feast with your, at your, you at your table in glory, through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Jesus, on the night before his death, took bread when he was gathered with his disciples. He blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. In the same way, he also took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil, for the kingdom power and the glory are yours now and forever amen friends you are invited to come forward as you are able to take a piece of the bread and to take a cup if you need a gluten-free choice <clears throat> excuse me that is here and i invite you as you take the elements to hold on to them and then we will take them together if any of you are not able to come forward and would like to receive the elements, please let me know, and one of us will bring them out to you. Once again, you don't have to be a Presbyterian or a member of this church. All you have to be is someone hungry for God's grace. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us join in the feast.
all have elements who so desire them. I invite you to take the bread. This is the body of Christ, a sacrament of God's love for us. Thanks be to God. This is the blood of Christ, poured out in love for us and for all of creation. Amen. Let us pray. God of Advent, we give you thanks this day for your light that shines in the darkness. We give you thanks for pregnancies of the Spirit, for holy encounters in the waiting rooms of our lives, for your paradoxical presence with us on our journey toward you. We pray for those in the fast lane of life, We pray for the healthy and the rich and the successful that they too may learn to wait with and encounter you in their waiting. We pray for the left behind, for those in the slow lane. We pray for single mothers and sick fathers, for 
overworked workers waiting for rest and for the unemployed waiting for a job. Give birth in and through them to a joy and a love that cannot be destroyed. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers. Even as we pray for patience, Lord, we pray that you would also make us impatient with injustice. Make us impatient with structures of oppression, with sins of racism and misogyny and more. Give us some of your righteous anger, not against your people, but against the ways in which we divide ourselves from each other and from you. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers. In this week that witnessed the horrible murders in Michigan, we pray for grieving families, stunned students, and a nation that is horrified. Even in our horror, we confess that we are still largely numb. Stir us from complacency, Lord, from this truce that we have made with forces of destruction and death. Help us as your people to turn from the worship of guns. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers. In this week in which we honor and seek peace, We pray for peace. We pray for peace in our world, in places like Ethiopia, Yemen, Israel, Palestine, the Western Sahara, Xinjiang, and more. We pray for peace in our communities and for the vision and ministry of prophets who show us the things that make for peace. We pray for peace with the earth with your creation, that we might more faithfully listen to the songs of the trees. We pray for peace in our homes, the peace that nurtures trust and growth. Most of all, we pray that our hearts might become receptive to the advent of the Prince of Peace, your Son, Jesus Christ. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for those who are lost or in the dark, for those who are far from home, who aren't in Kansas anymore, but feel alone on their journey. We pray for those who wait for healing from sickness, for freedom from addiction, for reconciliation with loved ones, for dark clouds to disperse, for new joy to be born in old souls. We pray especially for those on our hearts, for Michael McCormick and Caitlin Bell, Mick Jensen and Rosemary Gross, for Emmy and Lewis and Brian and Crystal, and for others we name aloud to you now. Bless them in their need, we pray, and use us in the blessing. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers. Finally, O Lord, we pray for ourselves. In our fast-paced world, may your spirit do the impossible. Teach us patience. Empower us to wait with the left behind of our world. And in our waiting with, may we work for justice and peace and rest. And may we receive your gifts of life and love with open hands and grateful hearts, giving praise to you. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers. We offer these prayers in the name of the Prince of Peace, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning and welcome again. Uh, Welcome to those of you who are joining us over Zoom or who will be watching this later on the internet. We are glad that you are here physically or virtually or whatever way that you're with us. Uh, If you're new to the church, we invite you to join our mailing list to contact the church office. Uh, We have an email newsletter that goes out every week. We can print it out for those of you who'd rather receive it in the mail. You can contact the church office at 940-382-8815. The next few Sundays after church, the children's ministry team is sponsoring some time in the fellowship hall to make or for the for families with kids to make ornaments. Um, So you're welcome to go in there after church. We ask that you would continue to wear masks. 
Um, also want to let you know uh, that yesterday we had an event where we were gathering food and clothing items for Denton County um, Friends of the Family and the Denton County Food Center. And there's a box out in the narthex for those of you who may have brought some or who want to bring some, either some it items of, certain items of clothing, socks, underwear, or uh, canned food or non-perishable goods. Um, two weeks from today on the 19th, uh, the, um, the, we are inviting others to come caroling with us. Um, we don't know exactly what that's going to look like, um, but we will endeavor to do it safely, probably with masks. We, but if you're interested, please talk to Lenora. Um, and also that same day, two weeks from today, that evening at 7 p.m., uh, we will be hosting a community Taze service that evening of, uh, with the theme of a blue Christmas. And so that's at 7 p.m. that evening on the 19th. Those are all the announcements that I... Yes, Phyllis? Um, thank you, Reverend Kelly, for being so faithful about registering for the service. It was a little uh, hectic during the second service, but we're going to be doing a Thank you, Phyllis. Let's stand and uh, sing our closing hymn, hymn number three. May we go out as nurturers of the new life and new joy that the Holy Spirit is even now bringing to birth in and through us.
And may the love of God, our creator, the grace of God's son, Jesus Christ, our redeemer, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, our sustainer, be with you now and forever. Amen.